Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Sonos Zone player and the model number is a ZP100. So in terms of specifications the device is a class D amplifier and the power output is 50 watts per channel RMS at uh, 2 times 8 ohms and that will increase to 100 watts times 2 into a 4 ohm speaker load. And then when you look from the front fascia very clean layout so you have the mute button which is the indicated by the speaker with the line through it and then you can increment or decrement the volume control and then connectivity is multiple so you can go wireless connection if you wish and then on the rear of the unit as you'll see later in the video you have four port ethernet switch and that'll support 10 by 100 megabits per second and good overall specification for total harmonic distortion it comes at 0.02% and that's over the entire frequency range for the human hearing which is 20 Hz to 20 kHz. The device also has a subwoofer output as well and you can connect both analog input channels if you wish as well as having audio output channels and the weight is 2.43 kilograms and then in terms of dimensions you're looking at 132 millimeters high by 268 millimeters wide with an overall depth of 160 millimeters. So what was the issue with the amplifier when it came into the workshop? Well the amplifier would not power up or the zone player would not power up. So first of course is the investigation phase and there was no sort of obvious sign so it came to the point of course where you have to dismantle the unit. And just to provide some insight and I'm sort of showing you the different stages. What is sort of interesting for the, the Sonos itself, if you sort of do any sort of Google to try and locate any circuit diagrams, service manuals or schematics, that appears to be none out there. And then also as well, uh, there doesn't appear to be any spare parts either, which is a little bit strange considering the popularity of these devices and also, you know, their other range of smart speakers, but, you know, that, that's, that's kind of how it is. So the way in which you get access to it is when you look from the top of the unit, you have a plastic grill and then what I would advise you to do um, for myself I just simply use a small tool with a hook on and then what you have to do is just to sort of work your way around it then just to remove this plas plastic uh, mesh and then what you'll see located and straight away you come across is that there is a security sticker as I'm showing and what this security sticker clearly tells you is if you remove it then your warranty will be invalid so straight off the bat, you know, if you do have one of these, you're going to investigate. If you're outside your warranty period, then, you know, you can you can remove it. But if you're sort of in your warranty period, I think that's sort of like the red flag, you know, don't go any further. So once you remove that, what you have is three very long screws that screw through into there. And then what you have to do then is just to turn the unit over. And again, I'm showing you this. What you can see is that there are four blue rubber feet and they are self-adhesive so just remove those and then what you'll see is that you have four fixing screws so once you remove those it's a case really it's like an extraction you can just extract the unit from the very very substantial um, aluminium chassis and again I'm, I'm showing you here with the device extracted now the bit to be very careful of is that when you remove the the cover from the top what you'll see is that there are two aerials so just ensure that you don't accidentally bend these if you're going to turn the unit over. You know, just place something underneath to prevent any damage. And then in terms of investigation, of course, because the unit didn't power up, that could be for multiple reasons. But as the initial investigation, of course, the power input via the multi-pin socket. So it's a two-cord, um, what I would say, like a figure of eight type lead. And with the mains plug on there just verify that you don't have any issues there in this case there was none and then the next part is of course is to get inside the unit and then do the investigation so what I'm drawing to your attention here is the input side of the power supply and what you are seeing are two Wickman type fuses now these fuses are rated at T4 amp so they are time delay or anti-surge type fuses and the first thing to check, of course, is to make sure that neither of those fuses have failed. Well, in the initial investigation, what I could confirm is that both of the fuses had gone open circuit. 
So that alerted you straight away that the reason for that is due to excess current draw. It would be highly unlikely that it was maybe a surge of power coming into the unit. So what I'm showing now is that the fuses have then been removed. But also as well, remember that that fuse blowing could be due to a fault on the amplifier side of the unit. This is the audio power output side. But it could also be linked maybe to the power supply side. And the power supply you know, is not uh, terribly sophisticated on the primary side but more so on the secondary. So the best course of action here and what I show is to disconnect the toroidal transformer from the main unit itself. So once I disconnected that and just a sort of insight for what this transformer provides as an output voltage, it's written on the side. So it is a dual primary toroidal transformer and then on the rear of the unit you have a switch. So if you move it across or move it up, you can then select for it to run on 120 volts or 230 volts, UK 230 volts, and that simply means that it connects the two primary windings in series, giving you the single primary input for 230 volts. And then the output is 0 36 volts, so quite you know a simple toroidal. And then once I'd done that, and I'd also confirmed that the two input protection fuses were open circuit. What I could have done is just power up the unit via the dim bulb test down. I've put a note into the circuit description here for your own reference. But just as added caution, what I'm showing you is two time delay 4 amp fuses. And then what I've done is I've just soldered some wire onto the top and the bottom of the fuser holders and then put them into the, the small uh, circuit board. And then what I've done then is once that's verified, I'll maintain the connection, of course, to the primary of the transformer. And then I then powered it up via the dim bulb tester. And from a good point of view, what you could see straight away is the bulb started to light quite brightly. And also it started to flicker as well. So that's a very good indication that the primary windings on the transformer had failed. So they've gone short circuit. So this transformer can't be bought. As I said, uh, you may be able to source like an equivalent, but because I have transformers manufactured, it was a simple case of just simply sending the transformer away then for a rewind. So when that's returned, simple matter is to replace the two Wickman fuses. So I'm removing the temporary fuses. And again, I'm showing you here. And then once those have then been inserted, the next thing I did was just to refit the transformer and straightforward. But remember that when you connect the secondary of the transformer to the main amp, just remember you have to use that inline protection, which is the bulb current limiter, just in case maybe that the transformer you know, was overloaded due to a short circuit, maybe on the output stage or something like that. Here there wasn't. And uh, once the zone player just completes its initialization, so its power sequence is quite straightforward. When you apply the power, when you, you'll see is that the... Ethernet port connection leads, the four port connection leads at the back, sockets, sorry, at the back, will just illuminate momentarily. And then what you'll see is that the front um, LED, which is just behind the push button that you would use to mute the audio output, it will just start then to strobe. So it probably takes, I'd say, a good sort of 10, 15 seconds, maybe slightly more, just to complete initialization. And then once you've, you've got that, the next thing I'm doing is just to verify on the rear of the speaker terminals that I've got no high DC offset and I didn't. It doesn't have a protection relay, it's all done in a solid state means and then in terms of test then to connect an audio signal to the rear of the device and you know it was good, you know, no, no issue at all and you had very very clear consistent audio. And then in terms of reassemble dead straightforward you just simply you know repeat what we did earlier in terms of dismantling it and then it was just a case of cleaning up the unit and then just verifying once it had all been reassembled you know correct operation just be aware that with the self adhesive feet you will need some double sided tape so just place the rubber feet on and then just cut them around them so you've got the full surface area and then just stick them back into position for the security uh, strip that I'd removed Again, the adhesion was already present, so I just put that back in place. And then once you've fitted all the different screws, it's just a case of just clipping on the top lid and the unit then was uh, was complete. 
So that sort of brings us to the end of this repair tutorial. So not a complex repair, but in itself insightful and interesting. And I have no doubt that uh, people who subscribe to the channel or maybe you do it in Google search, you may well come across this particular fault and it will provide you the insight on how to repair that. So as always, I thank you for stopping by and I appreciate uh, you taking the time. And if you need any form of information or support, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com and I'll be more than happy to come back to you and give you any guidance or support that you may require. So, bye-bye.